Today we're going to be going over a full guide to coding interviews. And my promise to you is that if you follow everything in this video and get an interview at Fang, you will get the job. Yes, a very big promise. This video is going to be a little bit different than my normal videos. It's going to be strictly business in this presentation form because this time I'm actually trying to provide value for the first time ever in my life. So this is the schedule for today. First, who I am so you'll listen to my advice, what theory you need to know, the formula I use to help with most lead code problems, how to practice and improve for these coding interviews efficiently, then I'm gonna go get lunch. I'm probably feeling some sweet green. If you haven't had it, you should try it. Then we're gonna be going through a live example of exactly what to do during these coding interviews. After that, we're gonna be going over the behavioral part of the interview and how to prep for that. And finally, some advice. Pretty much, I'm just trying to make this video what I would have wanted to see when I was starting out with these coding interviews. But yeah, hopefully it'll be helpful. Maybe it will, maybe it won't, but we're doing it anyways. So first, who I am. Pretty much all that matters on YouTube is Fang, so yes, I got jobs at Fang. I also just graduated from CMU and made some YouTube videos that you guys should check out. Now I work in high frequency trading, and if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. Just know that you can trust me. Maybe. Man, I don't even know. Alright, so now let's talk about the theory, and this is the part that you absolutely need to know. These are some data structures and algorithms, and I guess I'll read them out for you. We got arrays, stacks, queues, maps, trees, linked lists, graphs, backtracking, dynamic programming, what? and heaps. So how you can learn these are through a university or online course that's usually called data structures and algorithms, and then on top of that, through YouTube videos. HackerRank is probably the best for the base understanding of these, and they have a video for all of them with the animations and stuff. It's actually really good. And there's also this absolute goat named Abdul who explains a lot of this too. You're gonna need to understand how they work, all their time complexities, how to code them up, and if you don't know how to apply them on this part just yet, don't worry because that'll come up later. And I'll be putting up a cheat sheet that I use to review before every single interview about all these data structures in the description. Okay, so now after you spend some time learning those, here's a formula that I use that helps with a lot of these lead code problems. And I guess I'll read it out again. If the array is sorted, then use binary search or two pointers. If a tree is given, then use DFS or BFS. If you're asked for all the permutations or subsets of anything, then use backtracking. If you're given a graph, then use DFS or BFS. If you're given a linked list, then use two pointers. If recursion is banned, then you want to use a stack. If you're asked for the maximum or minimum of some subarray, then you're going to be using dynamic programming. If you're asked for the top or least k number of items, then use a heap. If you're asked for the common strings, then use a map or a tree try. If you need to keep count of distinct elements, use a map or a set. And else, you're probably pretty set if you just go with a map or set in the problem. And you can also try sorting the array and going back to the first if statement. And yeah, I think this formula can help with the first step for a lot of these problems. Okay, so now how do you practice efficiently? I've watched a ton of videos about this, but I think this is what helped me the most. You go to the lead code fang list or grind 75 and do one problem from this a day. You try the problem and if you don't know how to solve it, which is going to be super common starting out, then look at the solution. Figure out how to solve it based on the solution and then give it an hour or so and then type the solution out yourself by the end of the day. This is not so you can memorize the solution to the specific problems because that doesn't matter. Instead, you want to get a sense of how to think about the problem and you can do that by seeing how other people solved it. The most important part is consistency, like doing at least one problem each day. And then honestly, it takes time, like for each person it's different. But eventually you get to a point where you don't have to look at solutions anymore and you can just figure out the problems on your own. Also keep track of which problems you solve in a spreadsheet and I'll leave a template for this in the description. Okay guys, so now we're going to be looking at a live example of exactly what to do. Here is a question that's really common and I'm just going to leave it up here for like 5 seconds. You guys can pause and read it on your own time. And yeah, there's a couple of key points that you should know for any interview that we're going to be going over. After you first read the question, I would reiterate what you think the problem is asking you to your interviewer because that'll just clear up a lot of confusion if you like are completely misunderstanding the problem. Here I would tell my interviewer something like, okay so this problem is giving us a matrix of ones and zeros and we have to return the number of islands which is defined by a group of ones surrounded by all zeros or edges of the matrix. 
and then they'll say like yeah or they'll correct you if you're wrong but in this case i think that's what the question is asking and i would say you don't need to ask clarifying questions if you don't have any but i guess one question you could ask here is does diagonal land count as being adjacent which is pretty obvious from the question like it's either horizontal or vertically but maybe you're misreading something and yeah the interviewer would be like yeah no diagonals do not matter for pretty much all of these problems, I would start out by thinking about how you would do the problem as a human without any computers. So if I was trying to solve this problem or like a five year old kid was trying to solve this problem, to count the number of islands, we have to find a, a one somewhere, right? If it's all zeros, then there's not going to be any islands because there's no land. So here we have a one. And how I would do this without a computer is look at all the ones surrounding it until we hit zeros and then we can count it as an island. So here, oh shit. So here, as we can see, this is a group of ones connected to this first one that we saw, and that's one island. So all these zeros I would see, and they're water, so they don't really count until we see another one. And then that one is connected to other land, and that's gonna be another island. So here we have two islands. And yeah, that's how you do it as a human. And pretty much all you need to do with the computer is the same exact thing because the computer can do it in milliseconds while a human would take, I don't know, like a couple seconds to do this small example. Next, key point number two is that all matrices can be thought of as a graph. So this left-hand matrix is the same exact thing as the right-hand graph. And then if we go back to our formula, if you're given a graph, chances are you're gonna be either wanting to use BFS or DFS. So in this case, let's do BFS. So first we see this one here, and then our computer can use BFS to view all the ones. It's gonna go like that. I'm assuming you're gonna know what BFS is, so it's going to see all these ones until it hits all these zeros which don't count. And then it's gonna be going to all these zeros which also don't count. And once it hits the one, we're gonna BFS around this one until there's no more ones. And just like how we did it without the computer, each starting one before BFSing is going to increment our islands count. So in this case, it's also two islands because we started with this one right here, BFSed out, and then this one right here, and BFSed out. And it doesn't matter which one in the island you start out with because BFS is going to spread through the entire island. Okay, so now we're going to code it, and I think that you can get away with talking however much you want, but I'll just give an example of how much I would talk while coding. Essentially, you just want to think out loud. First, we're going to have to keep track of the number of islands, and that's going to be our solution, so we're going to return it. Then, because we're going to be using BFS, we only want to visit each index of the matrix once. And so because we're going to have to keep track of each distinct index that we're visiting, we're going to be using a map or a set. So we're gonna call that visited and continue. Next, we wanna be looking at all of the indices. So we're gonna loop through the entire matrix. If we already visited this index, then we don't want to visit it again. And so when we finally hit a one, we know that this is gonna be the start of the island. So we're gonna have to BFS out from this. And we also have to increment our islands count. Okay, so now we have that part set up and now we just have to implement the BFS. First, we're gonna have to consider some base cases like if we're in the bounds of our matrix. Also, we need to check if we've already visited this index. Then we're gonna add it to our visited set. And I also forgot to do this in this part right here. So we're gonna add it here. And also sometimes during the problem, you just lose complete focus. Like right now, I just did that, um, but it's all good. You just need to like read through exactly what you've been doing before and then you'll regain where you were at. So right now we just completed the base cases. So we need to, uh, if it's a one, then we're gonna have to do more processing. And if it's a zero, then we can just not consider this point. At this point, we're going to have to BFS in all horizontal and vertical directions. So we're going to have to set the directions. Okay, so that looks pretty good for me. Um, before I would run it, I would just go through one check here. So we're going to start here, check that it's in viz, add it to viz. If it's a one, then we're going to have to do our BFSing. And then the BFS, we're going to be popping, 
doing all these base cases. See, this is important right here. I just saw a mistake. So here I needed an equal because if we got to the length of the grid, okay, then now there's another problem because we needed just the rows. But yeah, if we got to the length of the grid, then we would be out of bounds. So that's why we needed this equal sign. Here, we're checking that it's in visited. If it's not, we're gonna continue, add it. If it's a zero, then we're not gonna care about it. And then we're going to BFS in all the directions. Okay, yeah, that looks all right to me. Um, of course, when you're running it for the first time, you're not gonna be 100% sure, but we can try it. And yeah, so mine is just completely wrong. Um, and that's fine because conceptually, I know what we need to do. So we're just gonna find out why it's wrong. Okay, so the problem here is that we added to visited before we did the BFS. And so it's going to count all the ones because it's hitting this base case of being in visited. So we need to move the visited after doing the BFS. And yeah, it passes now. But in the interview, you won't be able to run this automatically. So what you have to do is put in your own test cases. So I would put in the examples that they give you and then have an assert statement like how it is here and you'll know if your code works. I would make some edge cases, like let's say the number of islands is zero. And then we would expect the answer to have zero islands. And also just like, I don't know, like an empty array to make sure nothing fails. And yeah, that's um, pretty much it. Maybe one island with all ones. So let's do that. And yeah, we see that it's still passing all these assert statements. And yeah, that's about it. If your interviewer says anything, like any recommendations during the interview, I would say just follow what they say. Like, don't think about it too much. And yeah, I had one friend that was being told to put print statements at some place, but he was like, no, no, I'm really close. And yeah, you don't want to do that because the point isn't really, or like the entire point isn't to solve the problem. Maybe like that's a little bit part of it, but more importantly is that your interviewer thinks that you'd be good for the company. So yeah, if you just like don't listen to them, that's pretty bad. So yeah, just listen to whatever they have to say. Then they're going to ask about the time and the space complexity of your solution. And for that, I would take the time complexities for each individual part and then go from there. So in this case, we're going to be touching every index of our matrix. So that's going to be O of N times M for these nested for loops here. Then in the BFS, sure, that could be another O of N times M potentially. But if we see here, we're using this visited set that ensures we only visit each index once. So yeah, that just stays O of N times M. Okay, and actually for this part, it's actually popping from the zero because we're trying to implement it as a Q. But yeah, that part should be O of one if you're thinking like using a Q. But actually the most important tip or fact that I've used for interviews is that if you're implementing a Q as a list in Python, this pop zero is actually going to be O of N when N is the number of elements in the list just because that's how it is in Python. And so this is actually O of N. It's not actually N because these Ns aren't the same, but it doesn't matter as long as you just know that it's not O of one. To make it O of one in Python, you actually have to use this class called deck. And so from there, this is gonna be pop left. And then this is actually O of one now. So when we run it, uh, honestly, we, there might be some errors. Okay, there weren't. But yeah, now it's actually a lot faster because we're using this deck. And yeah, if you mentioned that you know this fact in your interview, like I've said it pretty much every interview and yeah, the interviewer just starts creaming. It's actually really good. So yeah, just know that. So because this is the equation for our time complexity, it's just gonna be O of N times M. And yeah, for space complexity, this BFS could potentially at most hold the entire matrix. So the space complexity is also N times M, which is the size of our matrix. And yeah, I would say that if you do everything like in this video, then you'll pass this part of the coding interview with flying colors. Okay, so now once you've mastered the coding part, you're gonna have a behavioral interview too. So the structure for most of these interviews is a online coding assessment, which is just lead code problems, a live technical interview, then a final round with other live technical interviews and a behavioral interview. The behavioral interview should actually be pretty chill if you just do this. First, there's a list of prompts that you should have answers prepared for in the star format. Some of them are like, tell me about a time where you overcame adversity, and I'll leave a list of them in the description with examples. Then to prepare for a specific interview, go on the company's websites and find their values. Then pick a few of them and think of some stories that show you embody at least one of these values. 
I think what most people don't understand or get wrong is that nobody actually cares about your story at all. Some people get really obsessed with including a bunch of specific numbers like how many people showed up to their Habitat for Humanities project on February 23rd. But I would say all the specific details don't matter. You just need to tell a story such that by the end of the story, they know that you embody at least one of their company values. An example would go like this. If I had an interview at IMC, I would go on their website and find out that one of their core values is constant improvement. So in the interview, they're probably going to ask something like, can you give me a time where you seeked out an opportunity to improve? And I would say, yes, of course. One time I had to give a presentation at a hackathon and I had thought that I was pretty comfortable public speaking. But this time I was presenting my project in an auditorium with over 200 people. I ended up getting really nervous and having stage fright and not being able to even finish my speech. After this, instead of not wanting to give speeches anymore, I took this as an opportunity to improve. I practiced public speaking and read books and watched videos about it in my free time. I then took more opportunities to speak in front of people at the CMU Hackathon and other club events, improving a bit each time. Finally, I got to a point where I was at my most recent hackathon, presenting my project in front of 200 people again. Except this time, I had built up the skills to be extremely confident and comfortable. Looking back, I'm actually really glad that I messed up before because it showed me that I had something to really improve upon and with slow, consistent effort, I was able to do just that. And yeah, the story is actually just completely made up. And yeah, honestly, it might be better if your story is somewhat grounded in truth, but the interviewer just does not care. All they're gonna write on their paper is that I am an improvement expert, I think. All right, so now if you wanna hear it, here's some advice. So in college, what a lot of people do is just ask their friends to do their coding assessments for them because, I don't know, they can't do it themselves. And what I would say is this is actually completely pointless because straight up, if you can't do the coding assessment, you're gonna have a super hard time in the next interview. I'm gonna try to not sound too corny, but you know, at the end of these videos, I always, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to inspire you guys a little bit, but <clears throat> let's see yeah you might as well put in the effort to get really good at coding yourself if it's your career because if you think about it it's straight up your livelihood and yeah i don't know i feel like if you get really good at it it would just make your life a lot easier and probably better also i will say even though it's kind of obvious if you get really good at these coding interviews you can get a really good relatively high paying job and i don't know i just started my job and i was able to take my mom out and everything to like really nice dinners and i feel like just that makes everything worth it and yeah i've said it like a million times now but i'm still on the whole trying to change the world thing um, with coding and contrary to popular belief i actually think that everything that you learn in lead code is actually really important in coding in general even if you don't use the same exact thing in your job i feel like the concepts and just how you problem solve can be useful. And yeah, a lot of these companies are laying off and having hiring freezes right now. And yeah, it actually really sucks, but I will say it's not gonna last forever. And if you can, you know, prepare and get really good at coding interviews by the time they start hiring again, then you'll get the job later. And I think it'll be okay in the long run. And last thing is, is that in these interviews, it helps if you can talk about a project that you've done. So yeah, try to find something fun that or you think that's interesting to code up. Okay, so that's all for this video. Next, I'm making an AI generated OnlyFans. Um, yeah, it's kind of tough coding it right now, but I'm telling you, this shit goes crazy. So yeah, subscribe for that. Hopefully this video was at least somewhat helpful. And yeah, that's about it. Peace.